Welcome to the Vet Dental Show. I'm Brett Beckman, board certified veterinary dentist, and we bring this podcast to you every Wednesday as a veterinarian, as a technician, as a dentistry team to help you be even better at veterinary dentistry in your practice. We're sponsored and partnered today with the Veterinary Dental Practitioner Program. If you're interested in being among the best anywhere in general practice as a team in veterinary dentistry, I invite you to request an invitation. Just go to ivdi.org slash inv, like invitation, first three letters, inv. So ivdi. International Veterinary Dentistry Institute, ivdi.org slash INV, and we'll get you the information that you need. Um, is there a preferred way of injecting a nerve block? Um, our head technician injects all nerve blocks inside the mouth, while the doctor in injects certain spots from outside. Yeah, there are a lot of d different techniques. There are a lot of different techniques. And there is not one that's preferred over others. It's what you're comfortable with, what you've learned. And there are some that can be done intraorally and extraorally. Um, I don't have a preference. My preference is that they get done. They get done correctly, they get done effectively, and they get done consistently. That's my only criteria. How they're done, as long as you've learn from a reputable source and that is is a technique that you're comfortable with I'm fine with it as long as it's getting done that's our you know and getting done correctly and safely for the patient that's our only criteria so there's a lot of different techniques for a lot of different tasks that we can perform so whatever your staff is comfortable with go for it absolutely can technicians do this nerve block administration or does it have to be done by the doctor? Um, you know what? <clears throat> I um, am an advocate of technicians doing as much as they can to free up that doctor and to move that case forward. And nerve blocks are absolutely in the technician's wheelhouse. If you're able to draw blood, place a catheter, you are able to administer a nerve block. That's certainly something with in your wheelhouse. It is not a surgical technique, so legally speaking, and per the you know uh, bylaws and, and restrictions set down by technician associations, um, we absolutely te te teach technicians nerve blocks all day long. So um, absolutely, this is something that's within your wheelhouse. So get comfortable with it, get going on it, and um, and certainly provide that for your patients. How do you get your doctor to do them more? One practice, I don't ever remember doing them back in the day. And, and yeah, this is again, something that needs to be established as a standard of care. It absolutely is required for dental patients so that we're able to, uh, number one, provide effective pain management, intra-op and post-op as well as keep them light under anesthesia and prevent anesthetic compromise. Those are the two biggest reasons right there. So the risk is minimal with the right training and the benefits are huge to the patient and the client. Because the patient is kept light under anesthesia, do you recommend giving nerve blocks before probing with known pathology to prevent reaction to sensitive spots? James, this is a really good question. Um, in some cases, we don't want to mask any areas of pain. So this is why we will do, number one, um, an awake oral exam so that Dr. Beckman can see if he can elicit any areas of pain so we know to really evaluate that area and, and know that we may need to treat that area, whether it be a tooth that has exposed dentin and needs to be bonded, 
or if we've got pocketing in that area. Um, so a lot of times when we're examining, um, we don't want to mask those signs. So if we see chattering, um, we're going to want to let the client know that we had chattering under anesthesia. This is why, and we treated that. So it, it gives us a little bit more information rather than um, getting those blocks on too early. Now, when I place my blocks right after x-ray, um, I'm going into the mouth immediately and doing that gross examination while Dr. Beckman is looking at the x-rays. So those blocks haven't taken effect yet as I'm doing that cursory cleaning and looking for pathology, looking for bleeding, pocketing, um, fractured teeth, all of that. So we're still, still seeing if there's any um, pain and with them being light enough, we can elicit any signs of pain. That's going to, you know, let us know we really need to examine that area and see if we can determine. So we don't want to mask anything um, just to give us a better idea and a better assessment of that patient. Good question. When performing an infraorbital block on a feline, how far do you place the needle? Um, yeah, you're not anywhere near the eye, you're underneath the eye. And um, we, again, on a feline patient, we're going to be using a 1cc with a 25 by 5 8 inch needle. So it's a shorter needle. Uh, Dr. Beckman goes right up to the hub. And um, that um, is absolutely appropriate. Um, I go about halfway with my needle, but you can go all the way up to the hub. You are underneath the eye. The eye sits on top of that um, infraorbital um, access or infraorbital um, entrance, and so the eye is above that. So um, we're not we're not anywhere near the eye where that's going to do damage. So no worries. When we are um, looking at anesthesia, and we've got some good anesthesia questions. Um, certainly uh, want to discuss that and again remember that light anesthesia technique is uh, there's a learning curve to it and I uh, often get questions um, get a lot of pushback especially from the veterinarians that um, this is not something that's appropriate we don't want them let that light under anesthesia we don't want them moving um, and we have to remember that we are only working in the mouth this isn't like we have an open joint or an open abdominal cavity we're only working in the mouth so we need them just asleep enough so that they're not moving but they still have that palpebral and it is a little bit of a fine line but once you get comfortable with it it becomes very very easy and um, and you'll see how well these these patients recover um, concern with light uh, patients risk of having them too light uh, trauma to the patient. Heather, I'm not sure what kind of trauma um, we're looking at. Again, we're not having them light enough where they're moving around, um, where, you know, dental instruments are going to be, you know, the patient's going to jump. Um, they're not that light. And if they are, we're going to know that um, ahead of them starting oral surgery. So again, it's, it's, um, it's, it's just getting used to what's appropriate um, and I'll do a paw pinch, I'll do the palpebral, um, I'll look at their respirations and Dr. Beckman when he's in the mouth he'll he'll say this patient is too light and he'll immediately stop what he's doing we ventilate um, before we get you know get where that patient's jumping up so um, so just it, it, it takes a lot of attention and it takes um, some getting used to but it's certainly another huge, huge benefit. And um, the mortality um, and morbidity with anesthesia with our dental patients is so rampant that this light anesthesia, um, when we explain this to our, pa our clients, our pet parents, um, it relieves a lot of their fear and it absolutely cuts down on so much compromise. We've had patients that we've had under for three hours or more Patients under five pounds that maintain a temperature of 99 degrees or more and have great cardiac output. Uh, they are 
um, comfortable, they recover quickly, they're up, they're wagging their tail when they go off to their owner an hour later. And so <clears throat> all of these huge, huge benefits that um, we can accomplish when we get good at getting down this, this level of anesthesia. Uh, how come we don't have a second tech devoted to monitoring the patient? Um, I do. Um, we absolutely have a, an anesthesia technician, um, myself and Dr. Beckman, that are working on patients. But not all practices have the luxury of having that, that extra anesthesia person. So that's why we can you know, engage the help of others, like I talked about, set a timer at your table and have someone come over and evaluate, and then use all those auditory um, or all those different senses, and including auditory, where you can still be looking in the mouth, putting your chart together, examining that mouth, and still be able to tell that the patient is breathing, the heart rate is where it should be, um, all of those things so that we don't have to stop every five minutes and monitor. We can keep going and keep that workflow moving ahead and engage the help of others. But if you have the luxury of having that extra person to monitor anesthesia, that's ideal. That's what we would absolutely recommend. But unfortunately, not all practices have the staff to be able to do that. So we use these other techniques um, to still help with, uh, with workflow. All right. So with our pain management, um, this is our next um, section. We had really good questions with, um, with our pain management. And um, again, um, pain management is something that you want to become familiar with. And uh, there's a number of different um, courses. We have a pain management course available now um, that um, pain management just goes hand in hand with, uh, with dentistry. Uh, oral pain is one of those um, uh, types of pain that is extreme. You know, right up there with back pain and you know child labor, um, but oral pain is uh, certainly very very intense. And so the better we're able to make our patients comfortable, not only preoperatively but postoperatively, um, is going to have a much better recovery and um, a much better client compliance in getting these patients to come back. All right. Um, Caitlin asks, uh, nerve blocks lasting 72 hours, do you still need to send home oral pain meds? Um, good question. It depends on what we're doing. So for instance, if we're just doing uh, closed root planing, I won't send home any pain medication. That nerve block is gonna be enough to, to maintain them and keep them comfortable. If we're doing extractions, I definitely am going to send home pain medications in conjunction. The nerve block we know lasts 24 to 72. The majority of the test group they showed was at 72 hours, but there are still some that it, some patients it's not going to last that long. So I want to make sure I'm not going to have any gaps. I don't know which patients are in which group. <laughs> so I don't want to have any gaps in my um, analgesics. So we're going to definitely send home pain management. Um, we typically do five days. The most intense pain after any oral surgery, whether it's two extractions or ten extractions, it's usually three days. After that it drops off significantly. The healing time is about two weeks for complete tissue healing. So we do a good five days of, of pain management for those patients and that, that um, tends to be enough. For those patients that are in the you know severe pain category like full mouth extractions, our cups patients, mandibulectomies, those advanced cases. We'll go out a little bit longer with our pain management and we may do gabapentin for a full month so that we can prevent these patients from getting back into that wind up state. Um, and so we are um, evaluating that on a case by case basis and what procedure uh, we've performed on that patient that kind of dictates our um, pain management protocol.
I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you'd like more information about the Veterinary Dental Practitioners Program, please submit to request an invitation at ivdi.org slash I-N-V.